This is another in the series of strategies for deploying virtual representations of the built environment. This time we focus on thermal bridges and the differences in predicted performance when we ignore them, and the differences if we take a lazy or a pedantic approach to describing them. And what is it like to actually include them in a whole building simulation tool such as ESVR? So what is a thermal bridge? There's a numerical definition, and there's a pattern matching definition. The red arrows show the racetracks for heat flow in a section of a commercial facade. Once you get sensitive to them, you find them lurking in construction documents all over the place. Indeed, the usual suspects are so pervasive that organizations like the Building Research Establishment have commissioned analysis of scores of building sections. One can find the results of this work online, and if you click on one of the items, you get the details of the junction and the patterns of heat flow discovered, as well as the so-called psi value. There are various engineering tools which can be used to calculate 2D and 3D heat conduction. Often someone else has done the calculations, so it's just a matter of finding which one is a good match to the particular junction in the building that you're currently working on. Historically, thermal bridges have been treated as noise when it comes to whole building th numerical simulation tools. A facility might have been available, but there is usually sufficient friction in the process to keep it from being part of a normal workflow. Building schemes such as Passive House get to their extreme performance goals not so much by super insulating the facades, but by ensuring those facades include far fewer faults. Passive House pays particular attention to designs that minimize thermal bridges. Is that kind of focus useful in projects with less extreme design goals? Let's look at a small residence and simulate it for the month of March. We'll do four variants. One with the usual, we're gonna skip over this thermal bridge stuff. One with a lazy approach, which simply takes default values. One assuming general values for best practice detailing. And lastly, one that sets values based on detail calculations for the particular composition of the junction. A simplified treatment of thermal bridges takes the psi value times the length of the junction and the temperature difference with the outside. Using the default for a 19 meter length of wall to ground floor gives a heat loss of 155 watts. But if we can be bothered to design better, we can drop that to 35 watts. Passive house designs aim for a psi value of less than 0.01, which would equate to roughly five watts. If we assess the energy demands for the month of March for this typical base case of ignoring the thermal bridges, we get in the order of 1,580 kilowatt hours. If we accept the default psi values, we get in the order of 3,000 kilowatt hours. Let's take the next step and compare default values with the use of generalized values for each of the junctions. The total heating demand reduces to roughly 2,290 kilowatt hours. And if we are specific and improve the junction details, we might get down to roughly 1,915 kilowatt hours, which compares back to the we couldn't be bothered case of 1,580 kilowatt hours. What's it like to do this? Well, let's take a mid-level apartment. It has an open plan living, dining, kitchen area, along with a small bath, single bedroom. On the left is a public passageway. On the right is another apartment. Both the floor and the ceiling are concrete structures, and the facade is a brick skin over structural insulated panels. The usual suspects for thermal bridges are where the concrete floor structure meets the facade, where internal partitions join the facade at the perimeter of windows and door architraves. ESPR includes a number of rules that it uses to evaluate the edges of the surfaces in the model. Their topology, the current boundary conditions, composition, orientation. But sometimes the user is needed to clarify an ambiguous edge. In the bath we choose in the bath, we will need to choose 
what happens at the upper edge of the facade. We select the general values, then we see a report on the initial distribution of thermal bridges. We could, of course, fine tune this, but let's move on. The bedroom also includes a request for clarification. If we go with the optimistic psi values, then that's also reflected in the report. The passage has no connection to the outside, so let's move on to the open plan kitchen lounge. Again, we get the interface that would allow us to manage the psi values and the links. There are also a couple of user-defined slots for conditions that do not fit into the usual descriptive slots. Note, as we leave the facility, we get an estimate of the heat transfer in terms of watts per degree K. Not all buildings are so easy to specify. Let's look at the process for the upper rooms of a residence. Here the topology would suggest the junction between the front facade and the ceiling of the up, at the upper level would be an intermediate floor. However, we know that it's actually, there's a roof space above and insulation above the ceiling. So we have a mix of wall to roof eave and wall to gable, as well as a few intermediate floor conditions. So, at quite a few edges and junctions, we need to make choices. Such choices are easier with a bit of planning, as well as access to compositional details. At the end of the process, we need to review the reported values and double check that they are correct. In most cases, it should not take very many moments to populate a model with initial thermal bridge values. Of course, additional time would be needed to update if we wanted to go to specifically matched and calculated values. When we're dealing with high performance facade, this might be something that we need to get into the habit of visiting.